Well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us for the Young Caregivers presentation. I am Toffer. And I'm Adrian. <laughs> and we are both children of MSA patients. We will take some time to tell you our stories, then discuss the similarities and differences between our stories. And how being a young caregiver of an MSA patient may be a differentiated experience from being an older spouse, friend, or relative. We will save some time at the end to answer some questions and possibly have some open dialogue as we welcome you to share your stories as well. If okay with you, Adrian, I will kick off by telling my story. Sounds good, Toffer, look forward to hearing it. Awesome. So here we are, Adrian and Toffer. <laughs> and now, my story. So my story starts with my family. As you can see in these pictures, I am one of five children, the youngest and what my family often call me the golden child. We grew up in the state of Maine where my parents both retired from the Navy and worked in the local school systems. My mother was the school nurse. So now if we fast forward many years, it is 2017 and I am 32 years old. I'm still figuring myself out as I've already transitioned my career from being a mechanical engineer in aerospace to being a product manager in financial services. I just wrapped up many years of grad school and ready to start figuring out the next chapter of my life. I am single. As you can see in the pictures, I'm traveling lots, both domestically and internationally with friends and simply enjoying life. And then one summer day, I get a phone call from my sister, letting me know that my mom's doctor's appointment for Parkinsonian-like symptoms resulted in a probable diagnosis of this new disease to us, MSA, multiple system atrophy. First thing I did, I Googled it, whoops. <laughs> some interesting things on MSA and the website, uh, on the web. Uh, and it was just a shock. I was in Virginia. My mom was living by herself in rural Maine. And one of my sisters in New Hampshire and all the other siblings, uh, one of the sisters was in New Hampshire and my, all my other siblings were either in Maryland or California. And I just remember again, I continue to Google the heck out of it and just getting into that rabbit hole and just was not fun. So after I let it soak in a little bit, I called my mom. She appeared with mixed emotions. On one hand, MSA is not such a great disease. On the other hand, we now have a finger to point at for some of the more recent and serious falls and other scares. And by the way, the, these are really tough conversations to have over the phone, as no matter how it went, there wasn't much I could do being hundreds of miles from my mother. After talking to all my siblings, we realized we needed to take some actions. And it is probably the military family in us, but we divided up the logistics of supporting my mother. My sister in New Hampshire being closest to my mother in Maine, would be going to a lot of the doctor's appointments with my mom. She was in some ways the air traffic controller for the doctor's orders. She also lived close to Boston. So that was helpful as my mom was seen by specialists at Mass General Hospital, including Dr. Vic Karana, who's on the MSA coalition board. One of the orders that the doctors provided and my sister delegated out was that we needed to have my mom live in a single story house. My childhood house was multi-level <clears throat> multi and we needed to change that. My brother in California, 
he was on house duty. His responsibility was taking on that role. And he helped my mother, as tough as it was, both emotionally and physically, move from our house in rural Maine into a single story house in suburban Maine. This type of splitting up duties came natural to my siblings and helped take that load and burden of this disease off of any one of us. And being that single son that liked to travel, my duty was vacation. So for this vacation duty, the first stop for us, I was just a few months after the diagnosis, we went to Nashville, Tennessee. And that is where we went to our first MSA coalition conference. Here, we not only had a great time at the honky tonk bars, the Grand Old Opry, and enjoying a showboat cruise, but my mother and I also met some awesome people from the MSA coalition. I remember clearly meeting Elaine Douglas, who's also on the board uh, now. I, I met her outside of one of the seminars. These types of chats were amazing as I not only got to meet folks, and learn more about the disease, but I could learn and be persuaded to do new stuff. I, I just remember Elaine's biggest recommendation, as she was a spouse of an MSA patient, was go on a cruise with your mother. As she becomes more dependent on her walker and her wheelchair, she will need accessible options, and cruises are perfect. And we took that advice to heart from Elaine. And within a month of being in Nashville with my mother, we both flew down to Florida and went to Disney and went on a Disney cruise. And it was amazing. Um, being on vacation duty, uh, we also followed that trip with a trip to Hawaii. Uh, and then uh, following that, um, my mother treated 23 of us, which is my siblings, their spouses and family, so my immediate family, on a Disney cruise the following year. Um, and you see some of the pictures here of that. It, it was just amazing. Um, and during these few years following her diagnosis, I spent a lot of time with my mom, as much as I could while keeping my career and job in Virginia. I continued to go to the MSA conferences in San Francisco and Orlando, but I started to travel less with my mother. There, there came a time where I had a, and this was maybe, I don't know, a few years ago, where I had to be a little selfish. I was in my mid thirties, still single and working hard. At the same time, I met the girl of my dreams and had to balance time with my mom and time with my future wife. This was tough, um, but I, I think I did okay. My girlfriend at the time joined me in traveling to visit my mother a few times a year um, and as much as we could. Oh, and then 2020 hit us, uh, COVID, and a lot of travel just stopped. This was tough, um, like we're doing today. We did a lot of visits over Zoom, uh, but once the COVID test came out, uh, my wife and I were one of the first to just get on that bandwagon, take the COVID test, uh, and take that drive up 95. Uh, and those were long drives, uh, but visiting my mom uh, in a safe manner as possible. Um, and that's kind of how the, the year went. Uh, and during COVID, my wife and I got married in a very intimate ceremony, and we're hoping to celebrate with our families once things are safe. Uh, it, it is neat to see my mom happy for me as I move into a new chapter of my life, but it does not come without mixed emotions that she may have less of a travel partner. Um, fast forward to today, with the COVID roller coaster of 2021, we've been able to visit Maine a few times this year, and my mother has been able to travel south to Maryland and Virginia a few times as well, visiting family down here. Um, and I also joined the board of the MSA Coalition as the caregiver representative. Now, in my story, you may realize that I do not necessarily talk too much about the medical details and stuff like that about MSA. 
I try to do my best to get my mom out there enjoying life, but also to try to balance my own life at the same time. So that's my story. Um, and now I would love Adrian to hear your story. Of course, great to hear your story, Toffer. So I'm an only child of divorced parents. Uh, my parents split when I was around sixth grade, I would say. And my mom and I were total best friends. She was a full-time single parent, but somehow always made sure she was involved in my school and dance activities. She was always present for performances and award ceremonies. And she really did her best to always provide absolutely everything I needed and wanted within limits. Mm -hmm. um, to say she lived her life for me is an absolute understatement. She dedicated everything she had to ensure that I had the best, most fulfilling life. And I did. So as you'll soon hear me share, when my mom eventually needed me after her eventual MSA diagnosis, there was no doubt in my mind where I needed to be and what I needed to do. And that was right by her side. So let's throw it back to, gosh, 2011, which was the year that I always like to say I felt my life was uprooted in an instant. Um, I was living in Brooklyn, New York, and I remember being on hands and knees on the floor of my Brooklyn apartment. My heart was pounding, the tears were flowing, my palms were sweating, and I'm religious, but not super religious, but I was putting everything into praying to the universe, God, whatever it is that you believe in, um, anxiously anticipating a phone call with the two words that I had been waiting to hear, which are she's okay. So a few minutes, which felt like hours before, I had found out that my mom had passed out and fallen alone in her home, a thousand miles away in Tampa, Florida. She was there by herself for what we think was maybe 12 hours before a family friend who came to join her for dinner realized what had happened. Not only had their dinner plans changed, but then I knew that my life would never be the same. So the year before in 2010, my mom had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, which most of you probably know is a progressive uh, neurodegenerative disease with no cure. But while hearing this diagnosis had been scary, the reality of her first serious health incident brought on a new level of fear and uncertainty and launched me into my new role as a millennial caregiver. So the next four years after that were tumultuous to say the least. My own life was not exactly where I wanted and thought it would be at that point. I was on the brink of turning 30, trying to figure out what I wanted to do when I grew up and living out the single girl dating stories in New York City that made sex in the city must see TV. I'd been living independently and had absolutely been responsible for only myself since graduating college. But now that was changing. As the favorite and only child of divorced parents, as I mentioned earlier, I knew caregiving would be bestowed upon me one day, but it happened 30 years sooner than I would have ever expected. I always imagined it would happen later in life when I had a partner and a family support system of my own. Don't get me wrong, I had great friends, but none of them were in a similar situation and just didn't get it. Now, I felt like I was living this insane double life. It almost felt like a dream, this crazy balancing act where one minute I was living it up with my friends and the next I was doing research or making phone calls or hardest of all, having to make executive decisions for the well-being of my mom. As most of you probably know, it's everything from life alerts, home health care agencies. I eventually took over her finances and had to look into long-term care insurance policies to assistive devices, senior living, medication management, and the list goes on and on. I was just living in this constant anxiety of the next phone call that would prompt me to book yet again 
a one-way plane ticket home to Florida because mom fell, she was hospitalized, or it was just time to take the reins in the next step of her care. The caregiving roles had come full circle. I was now a mother to my mom. So I would fast forward about five years. I moved back to Florida after a decade living in New York City. Just the stress, anxiety, and the fear of mom's state from day to day, coupled with her state of affairs, was just no longer manageable from a distance. There was no other choice than to give up the life I had known for the last 12 years, having to turn down my dream job, leave a core group of best friends behind, and a city that had shaped me into who I am today to move back to a state I hadn't lived in since 2003 and start all over. But like I said earlier, my mom needed me and just like she had always been there for me, it was now time for me to be there for her. Well, what a relief you're probably asking living in close proximity. Sure, of course, having mom only a 30 minute car ride versus a two and a half hour plane ride was a game changer, but a progressive disease, as you all know, is filled with its own set of challenges and an ever changing state. I always like to compare it to that whack-a-mole game. Once you think you're going to coast for a while, something else just pops up to tackle. So my first order of business, unlike the independent living community I moved mom into after her fall in 2011, her disease progressed and we were faced with the next stage of long-term care, assisted living. Oh, the search for an assisted living was not easy. And this next phase was providing a total reality check. Imagining my 74-year-old mom amongst 80, 90, even 100-year-olds, some with physical limitations and some mental, all at different stages of aging. Fortunately, since I needed a good balance for mom, I was very blessed to find an amazing senior living community to move her into. So after I moved mom down to South Florida from Tampa, I got her a new movement disorder specialist. And that movement disorder specialist is the one who re-diagnosed her with multiple system atrophy, MSA. Kind of like Toffer says, it was almost a relief as it explained so many of her additional symptoms. I think the worst for my mom was the fluctuation between the hypotension, the extremely high blood pressure, and the hypertension, the extremely low blood pressure. But as the years went on, I did my best to show up as the most dedicated daughter and caregiver to my mom. I would be at her assisted living probably 25 hours a week, trading off with her other private aides as not too long after she moved into assisted living, we were told that she needed round the clock one-on-one -on -one attention or she would have to move into a nursing home as her level of care was too high. As mom's uh, MSA continued to decline, probably as a lot of you are, I was in just complete denial. You'll need a hospital bed, they said. A special wheelchair for her posture, they said. She's not eating much, they said. It was all falling on my deaf ears. So the beginning of August, 2020, unfortunately, things took a turn for the worse. My mom got another UTI, but this time the medication just wasn't clearing it up like it had every other time she had a UTI because they were frequent. She wouldn't open her eyes and she wasn't eating much. And then one day she just completely forgot how to swallow. And therefore we couldn't give her solids or fluids and she couldn't take her meds. I had to make the sole hard decision to enroll her in hospice, which is an entire story for another time, but I highly recommend hospice to anyone. I think there's such a stigma around hospice, but trust me, it will be a blessing for not only you, but also your carry in their final stages of life. And after just a week and a half later on August 26, 2020, my mom passed away. Um, so at the start of it all, I had no idea about the caregiving journey I was about to embark on. 
there was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. But now that I am a year out from what I like to call graduating from caregiving, I'm able to look back. Um, and without having this experience, without having become a caregiver far too young, I would never be where I am now, which is finding purpose and passion in helping young caregivers, speaking on stages about my care journey, being featured in articles on podcasts, and continuing to share my story through my Instagram account. And for me, this second chapter of my journey is just the beginning. So now that I have had the opportunity to share my story, and you've heard Toffer's story, which definitely have some similarities and differences, just goes to show um, the differences in young caregivers and having siblings and being an only child and different roles that we take on. So enough about hearing about our care journeys. We would absolutely love to hear more about your care journey story. So if you feel comfortable, we would love for you to pop in the chat a little bit about your care journey. You can give us the entire story. You can give us a little snippet of it. And we put some prompts here just to get you started. So feel free to pop that in the chat. And we would love to circle back to that when we get to the Q&A section of our presentation. Um, so feel free to add that at any time. So we wanted to move into the ties that bind us, um, common themes, sentiments, and decision-making processes that differentiate younger from older caregivers. The first of those being a career transition. And it's deciding continue working a nine to five versus self-employment. So I'll pop in some of my feedback and my thoughts on this just based on my experience. So as you know, I was living in New York City. I was working a nine to five job. Fortunately, I had very amazing bosses that when I had to drop everything and book that one way flight home to Florida, fortunately, they allowed me to work remotely. They didn't put any time limits on the amount of time I was gone but it created so much anxiety that I wasn't there in the office, that I didn't feel like I was performing the best that I could at work. Fast forward to when I moved to Florida, I also took on a nine to five job, but that nine to five job meant getting off at five o'clock, if I got off at five o'clock, which was never five o'clock on the dot. For anyone who's lived in South Florida or who currently lives in South Florida, five o'clock traffic is just the absolute worst. You could be sitting in a traffic jam for two to three hours. So the stress of trying to get over to my mom's because I would go see her every night after work. I wouldn't get there until late. My mom went to bed early. So everything was just combusting for me. I wasn't really happy in what I was doing. I think there's a big difference if you're really happy with the type of job that you're doing, but I hadn't quite found my place in the career world. So eventually after all of this stress of just working the nine to five, having to take off to take mom to doctor's appointments, as a lot of you know, a doctor's appointment, you don't walk in at the time of your appointment and walk out an hour later. So the stress of elongated appointments and getting back to work on time, it was just all too much. So for myself, I made the decision of, could I work for myself? Could I decide to become self-employed? And that's exactly what I did. I did some Googling to figure out how the heck I could get out of my nine to five. And I found virtual assisting. So I have a background in public relations, project management, marketing. So I said, well, I have the skill set to do this. So I took a leap of faith. I quit my job and I started out working for a virtual assistant agency. No, it wasn't ideal, but it paid my bills barely, but it also gave me more freedom. I eventually up-leveled and decided to start my own virtual assistant business, which has now blossomed into my own project management business. And the best part about this is that I am my own boss. For the most part, I can make my hours, which means if I wanna work at five o'clock in the morning or 11 o'clock at night, I can. And the biggest piece of it all is it gave me more space and freedom to be able to be there for my mom, to be able to show up for her. I mean, as long as I had my laptop and a Wi-Fi signal, I was gold. I could work from her ALF apartment. 
I would take my laptop when we were waiting in the waiting room for doctor's appointments. And my laptop has seen the inside of hospital rooms and ERs more than most laptops. So it definitely allowed me to continue furthering my career in the midst of caregiving, but also mostly allowed me to be able to show up and be there for mom more without the stress of the nine to five grind. So that's my experience with um, the career transition. Toffer, I'd love to hear more about where you stand and how that yeah. career that's, transition has evolved for you. It's fascinating because it's something that I don't really think about that much. Um, and I think there's a few factors with that. Um, one is I talked about how um, if you think of being a caregiver as a full pie, um, each of my siblings and I kind of took a piece of the pie. Um, and my piece of the pie is a fraction of what Adrian, you um, had to care for. Um, so when I think about how has work changed um, now that I am there more often for my mother, um, I think it starts with what my motivations are for work and how I work. I'm more of a work to live type person than I live to work type person. As much as I love my job, um, I always make sure that there's a work-life balance there. And I think you saw that through um, the ability to travel, visit friends, just have fun. Um, and, and I think the, the transition uh, from work was already kind of there of whenever I started my job, it's like, hey, I'm going on all these vacations. I hope boss is okay. And we always made it work. Um, I, I was used to working remotely as needed, always being on call as needed, and um, being agile in the way that I work. Um, so, so for me, I've always worked a 95 job um, with flexibility. And um, the, the transition was more of transitioning from what do I do outside of work? Um, but there are some like pieces of advice that I would provide um, as I stayed in corporate America. Uh, the first is just be upfront and honest with your, with your leadership, with your colleagues. Um, there's a saying of like, keep your, your life at home and only bring your work to work. But I think it's really important for um, the people at work to realize that like, hey, um, I may have to leave with no notice or hey, yes, this trip, as I mentioned, like this Disney cruise sounds kind of minor, but this is a lot more important than work right now. And like, I will be dropping things and just getting people to be used to that mentality of, hey, I'm dependable, um, but I'm going to prioritize life a little bit differently than I have in the past. Um, but yeah, so for me, um, continuing to work that nine to five, um, and I think that the condition um, that my mother's MSA has progressed is in a way that for the most part, any visits with her um, can be, um, and knock on wood, can be planned. Uh, so there's for the most part, uh, the ability to just plan around uh, my mother at this point. Real quick, Topper, yeah. I, I know I've heard from a lot of people, and I thought that way too when I worked in a nine to five. I completely agree about having to be very vocal and just upfront and honest. I know which is hard when some people tend to be more private, but especially in this type of setting, it's kind of important to put your baggage out there, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Have you ever felt that your chances of getting a promotion or a raise or basically advancing in the company would ever be limited as a result of it being known that you have this caregiving part of your life, just out of curiosity? It's a great question. I think um, for me, like the company I work for is just amazing. Um, they care so much about the people um, that keeping that honest and open dialogue of what are the factors that actually matter to you, boss, or to you, company, um, and focusing on those more so than having my butt in a chair in the office um, is important. So having that dialogue is important. For me personally, 
I never have been concerned um, about that next promotion or that raise. Uh, but there were definitely times where I didn't care because work is just work. And these are the opportunities with my mother that I don't want to pass up. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think I had any of those concerns. And just right back at you, Adrian, like when you made the decision to go from nine to five to self-employment, was any of that due to that concern? Um, no, it was, it was really due to wanting the freedom. And I think coupled with just, I'd been in different career fields. So it was just more like, I'm not really finding anything that I like. My current job is not really what I want. So why am I putting myself through the ringer on a daily basis to try to continue working a nine to five? I'm not crazy about while caregiving. Now I can tell you that multiple times in trying to start my own business, I wanted to just throw it all out the window thinking I was just absolutely crazy for trying to start my own business, which is a lot of self-motivation. It's a lot of work. Um, while I was in the midst of the caregiving, knowing that my caregiving journey was just going to become more demanding. But one thing I know I always told myself, Topper, kind of like what you said earlier, you have to be a little bit selfish in this journey. I always knew that I needed to continue to pave the way for myself because the reality is I knew that my mom wasn't going to be here forever. So I wanted to ensure that I had laid the foundation for myself and my future for when she was gone. And now that my mom's been gone a year, I can tell you that I'm so grateful that I just continue to push on um, so that I do have a thriving business and a little bit of a sense of identity outside of my caregiving role. So very good. Well, let's move on to the next yes. um, the next topic, which is how do we relate to our peers? Um, I think that there's always a concern of isolation as being a young caregiver um, is more of the anomaly than the norm when it comes to caregivers, especially for um, degenerative diseases for elders. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, it's more common and probably if we look around at the conference, you're going to see a lot of caregivers who are spouses or older relatives. Um, for us, being young caregivers, when you look around, there's almost a sense of isolation sometimes. Um, and I'd love to hear just from you, Adrian, just kick this off of how, how, is, it, how is the story for you when, when you relate to your peers or when your peers relate to you? Yes. Um, I know that this is just such a common theme, especially being isolation, falling into caregiving at a younger age. I know for me, my whole life, I felt like, you know, I have a really solid core group of friends who I am very fortunate. I am still friends with all of them to this day. I hear so many stories about when people step into their caregiving role and demands of caregiving take over that friendships are lost because people can't relate to what you're going through. When you're in your 20s and your 30s, even your early 40s, your friends aren't necessarily worrying about caring for a spouse or a parent or a loved one. They are going through all of the pivotal milestones that typically happen in your 20s and 30s. It's illustrated in this picture. It's dating, it's traveling, it's graduating from college, buying your first home, getting married, having your first child. And I felt like I was always on that same wavelength with my friends, but then when I really started getting in deep in my caregiving role, I slowly felt myself kind of separating from them. And while they were that school of fish that was still swimming forward, I felt like, I don't know if it's Finding Dory or Finding Nemo, that saying, like, I was just trying to just keep swimming at this point. And while my friends were completely supportive, I have found this to probably be one of the hardest parts of being a caregiver at a younger age. I, you know, just got engaged earlier this year. I'm getting married next year. I don't have any kids. I haven't bought my first homes and I just turned 40 in January. So it's very interesting to see yourself staying stagnant while you see everybody around you starting to move forward. And I know for myself, it was kind of like, oh, woe is me. Why is this happening to me? Why is it not happening to anyone else? And I've come to embrace the journey. And now looking back, I do understand reasons why this happened to me, but, but it's very tough. And it's also very tough to find people your age 
who can relate to what you're going through. Um, I know for me, it took a while for me to find any other young caregivers who would get me. I mean, my friends would always listen to me, but I think the last thing my friends wanted to hear was how my mom had another fall or how I put her on this type of medication or how she was in the ER. Like nobody wants to hear about that. Um, so finally finding what I like to say, this new set of friends that we never thought that we would have. And that's a set of young caregiver friends, people who can actually get you and empathize and truly understand what you're going through. So tougher, not quite sure what your thoughts are on this topic as well. Yeah, I, I look at the pictures and um, as mentioned, I just got married and we're in the process of buying a house and um, it's on that aspect of my life, just swimming with a school of fish and just trying to swim is that is the life there of like so many things going on. And on top of that, um, having this extra variable and, and it sounds horrible when I just say like, oh, my mother is a variable, but uh, it, it's an extra thing to think about. Um, and again, grateful to be in a larger family where um, I am worrying in different manners. Um, but for me, there's, I, I think, as you just mentioned, like you get sympathy from friends and they may want to hear about it, but they're, it's going to be tough for them to empath uh, truly empathize because you can only guess all of the things that we're going through. Um, but at the same time, I have to make these decisions of, do I focus on myself or do I focus on my mother? Um, and there are some times where there is no in between and you just have to make the call. Um, and I think with some of the things, I'm just one of my peers. Uh, in other ways, yeah, maybe I'm uh, a little, uh, uh, one of the last of my friends to get married, for example, and things like that. Um, but it's, uh, again, I, I think that for me, relating to my peers through all of this, um, I'm just grateful that they're there to listen um, and try to empathize. Uh, and, and at the same time, I, I wish early on with uh, the MSA, I connected more with young caregivers um, through the coalition. And hopefully we can find that network or utilize some of the networks that you already have, Adrian, um, to be able to connect, just to get at least some pointers of like, how do I navigate all of this? Um, because friends can't help navigate, hey, uh, when you buy a house, are you gonna make sure that the you have a first level bedroom uh, for the mother? Or do we not think about that too much because we can always just travel up to me? Like there's all these little things um, as we go through these big milestones in life um, that there's just this extra variable to think about. Great. So maintaining a sense of self-identity. I touched on this a little bit. Um, you know, I, I always joke around and I say, kind of like when you used to go to school and it's like, hey, Adrian, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself. And for so long, it was like, oh, I'm Adrian. I'm an only child. I love to dance. I love to travel. Um, then later in life, it also became this, and I am a primary caregiver, which was <laughs> absolutely mind blowing to me because I never thought early in life that being a caregiver would be a sense of my self identity. So as I mentioned earlier, depending on your caregiving situation and you know, just from Toffer and I, you can see that our caregiving journeys are very different. And I hope, you know, some of you that are putting your caregiving stories in the chat will be able to see how your story has similarities and differences for us. But I believe that one thing that is very true is that we tend to lose our sense of self when we become caregivers, especially those of you who are 24 seven caregivers, who are living in the same home with your caree who are tending to them round the clock, you've quit your job, 
um, because you just don't have the time to dedicate to it and have really committed your entire life to becoming a caregiver. And we forget to lose that person that we were before caregiving. Um, we all have hobbies and things that we like to do. And while it's important to try to maintain those hobbies, let's be honest, we put ourselves last. I know I do. I don't want to speak for everyone else. I think Topper's done a really great job in trying to find that balance, but I can tell you I, I didn't. Um, so I think my best piece of advice to anyone um, who is a young caregiver or otherwise is really try to find pockets of time in your days, in your weeks, in your months to continue doing the things that you like to do. Because like I said, unfortunately, we all are caring for someone with a degenerative neurological disease. The reality is they're never going to get better. And the reality is they're not going to be here one day. And I always told myself, I didn't want to be left with nothing. I didn't want to have my mom pass on and literally sit there and think, now what? Who am I? What am I going to do? What do I like to do? Because I forgot what I like to do. So I think that's a very important lesson in a caregiving journey is always, even if it's for five minutes a day, if you like to write, journal, write. If you like to read, make sure you do that. If you have a dream of owning a business, I mean, I'm not saying that you have all the hours in a day to dedicate to it, but even if you can put a little bit of time every single day towards fulfilling that dream, you'll be able to maintain that semblance and that sense of self-identity outside of just being a caregiver because you're so much more than just a caregiver. This is just one chapter in your life. Awesome. Adrian, I think you covered that topic really well. Um, so we'll <laughs> move forward um, as we look at time as well. Sure. Um, and. and like as we wrap up, um, one thing that you probably have noticed is we both have some some tough moments for sure, as any caregiver may. Um, but it's also important to um, really think about the positivities that you can take from these experiences. Um, and how can we, especially as young caregivers, um, use our strengths to kind of really find that play and the, um, the silver lining of this disease. Um, for me, I, I think about it as, hey, I still have lots of energy. Um, I am happy to play travel agent. Um, and my whole purpose with that piece of the pie is how do we make the most of these years that we have with my mother and that she has with us uh, to experience new experiences, uh, to enjoy more and more family time as much as possible, um, and make sure that we spoil ourselves, both as a caregiver and as a patient, um, and just be grateful uh, of the way that this disease can bring us together. Uh, within the silver lining topic, Adrian, is there anything that you would want to add? I think you touched on it. I think the way I always look at it is if my mom was never diagnosed with MSA, I would never have spent the amount of time that I was able to spend with her in the last decade of her life. So for me, it's, it's always remembering that, remembering that you've been given the gift of time with your loved one. As we get older, we're like, see ya, we're out of the house, we're doing our own thing. So I think it's honestly, at the end of the day, a blessing to be able to have this time with them. And I think also just remembering to just be present, be present with them, try not to think so much about the disease, but remember the person that they are and just really enjoy every moment. So as we're nearing the end of time real quick, I think we want to share some lessons learned. I think one of the lessons learned, like I just said, is, is really staying present. I know for me, as my mom continued to progress, like I would only reflect on, I wish I had my old mom back. I want my old mom. I want the mom that, you know, the life that we were supposed to live. My mom was retired. We were going to go traveling together. We were doing all, supposed to do all of these things. I was stuck in the past. Like I said earlier in my presentation, everything was falling on deaf ears. 
So when I finally, I guess I could say the light bulb came on and I had heard a saying something to the effect of, you need to forget the, forget the ghost of who she was and embrace who she is now. And that was a game changer for me in being present with my mom in trying to not only focus on her mm-hmm. medical conditions and caring for her in a physical way, but also ensuring that we still had that emotional mother-daughter bond, doing things together that she liked to do, sharing stories with her, and just continuing to treasure the moment. So being present and really treasuring every moment and take lots of pictures and videos um, because now that my mom is gone, looking back, I'm so glad I have so many beautiful pictures and videos of the two of us together. Um, for me, yeah, thank you. Uh, for me, I think there's three things. Um, one, as mentioned, if you can um, delegate, uh, find help. Some of it may be within your family. Some of it may be paying for help if you can afford it or finding services um, so that it's not all on one person. And hopefully it's not all on you. Um, for me, again, with family delegation throughout the siblings um, is a great start um, as we are really in the middle of our journey. Um, The second is uh, to understand that it's okay to be selfish. Um, As Adrian mentioned, uh, there's going to be a moment where your loved one um, is no longer here and you are still here. And you want to be able to make sure that you have some continuity and continue your life in the direction that you want it to go in. Um, that selfishness may come from, uh, and it may look like uh, where maybe you stretch yourself still at work, maybe you pick up new hobbies um, to yourself. Uh, maybe you, maybe a, a selfish thing is you spend more time with your loved one uh, because you want to have those memories. Um, But in short, thinking about yourself and what do you want is just as important as what does your your parent or the patient want. And and then finally, have fun. Um, It's very similar to what Adrian was saying of my mother is who she is. It's not who she was, it's who she is. Um, But that shouldn't prevent us from doing a lot of things. Um, Yeah, she may be Uh, really hard at walking and dependent on a wheelchair or a walker. Um, But I I think a nice story to talk about is I was in New Hampshire visiting our nieces and my wife and my mom took our nieces out for the day. Uh, We drove by a bowling alley saying, oh, that would be fun. And my mom's like, eh. And she's like, okay, let's do it. Um, And sure enough, my mom was like half leaning on her walker and trying to bowl and it's sad, but she fell. Um, but do you know what? Like we could have stopped everything there and said, oh, no, this is bad. Let's not do it. Um, and looking at the kind of negatives of that, or we could say, do you know what? Those things are going to happen. Um, we are having fun. Uh, let's make sure that obviously my mother is okay, but let's continue the day and continue having fun. Um, and make good memories. So having fun is is so important Um, in these times of such a really awful disease. Um, But uh, there's going back to that silver lining, there's always ways to find the good things. Totally agree. So we wanted to share some resources for you specifically as young caregivers. Obviously there are tons of resources for caregivers out there. But as you heard um, through both Toffer and I's stories and, and chatting about some of the challenges that young caregivers face, it's really hard to find a group of peers of young caregivers to relate to, people that will truly understand what you are going through. So first and foremost, um, the MSA Coalition is a phenomenal resource. I know for myself when my mom's disease was declining and there were different things happening. I joined the different Facebook groups that the coalition has. And I would put my questions in the Facebook groups and people were so willing to share and answer and be supportive. 
there was a wealth of knowledge as it specifically related to MSA. So I highly recommend the MSA Coalition Facebook groups along with the MSA Coalition Hotline, if you haven't heard about it, a phenomenal resource as well um, that you can call and have a friendly voice on the other line who can help talk you through whatever you might be going through. So specifically for young caregivers, I know, as I mentioned earlier, um, one of the defining moments was when I joined a Facebook group for young caregivers. And I've listed a couple of Facebook groups for young caregivers below. Um, Caregiver Collective is the first one that I ever joined. I'm also a member of Young Caregivers, the caregiver space. And you can just search these in the search on Facebook. And there's also my personal um, private Facebook group for young caregivers, Young Life Interrupted, which I would love to have you join if you are a young caregiver looking for some support. Also a great resource if you're on Facebook and Instagram, all you have to do is a, is a hashtag search. I know you've probably heard of these things called hashtags, but it's amazing how much you'll really find when you search a hashtag. So if you go in there and you search millennial caregiver, young caregiver, you're bound to find other Instagram profiles to follow. I follow a ton of young caregivers on Instagram, each with their own unique story. Um, but I guarantee you by following a couple of those handles, you will start finding commonalities and similarities and finding that you're not as alone. And finally, I just released in August in honor of the one year anniversary of my mom's passing, the Young Life Interrupted podcast, which is the first podcast for young caregivers. On it, I share my own personal care journey and I have guests and experts in the field who are also joining me for episodes. So some great resources that you can, that you can tap into. And we just want to do a call to action to all of you that we hope that there are two actions that you'll take away from our presentation. The first is we would love to um, challenge you with committing to tapping into one of the resources provided. We're not asking that you be an A plus overachiever and do all of them, but pick one, pick the one that feels that resonates the most with you, whether it's joining in the Facebook group, listening to the podcast, doing a search on the hashtags, diving more into the MSA Coalition website. There's a wealth of resources there, but definitely check out at least one resource. And secondly, we would love to know how the MSA Coalition can better support you as a young caregiver. So if you can, if you have any ideas, feel free to pop them into the chat. Um, we are active and live in the chat, so we will definitely see those and ensure that we document anything coming out of that so we can take it back to the board of the coalition and see what new ideas we can bring to life. Well, awesome. I think that is the end of our presentation. Uh, so we now are going to kind of transition to looking at the questions and the comments that we have in our chat and Q&A feature. All right. Well, thanks so much, Topper. It was a pleasure. Look forward to diving into the Q&A with you. Thank you, Adrian.